Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator, and I've spoken a fair amount in the past about archery and bows, mostly long bows and crossbows, um, but I just thought I'd give a little shout out to Will Sherman's Medieval Arrows. Um, I'll link his Facebook page below this video. Um, but I have shown these before, but I don't think I've done a proper big video talking about them. This is not going to be that video, I'll do a proper video at some point. But just really to uh, remind you that Medieval Arrows are quite different, certainly Medieval European Arrows, are quite different from things to what any of you who do modern archery would be used to. The most notable difference is they are larger, fatter shafts, and I love a fat shaft, um, but these are, they have to be big and sturdy because they have to be able to take the um, acceleration force essentially from, uh, and the poundage behind the heavy war bows shooting them. Now, of course, if you're using a long bow that's only 60 pounds draw weight or something like that, you don't need arrows to be this big, but if you're shooting 140 to 200 pound draw weight bow, then you do need arrows that are this big. You'll notice that these are slightly different um, diameters. The historical surviving examples do range uh, in size. Um, but there's uh, there's one other, I'm gonna talk about the fletchings in a separate video. You'll notice incidentally that they are um, threaded um, or rather bound on with, um, with thread, with silk thread, um, and this green stuff known as verdigris. Essentially, my understanding of it, um, and if you know more about this than me, feel free to comment underneath, but the, to me, the most important aspect of the binding is that it's because the, the glue by itself isn't necessarily strong enough to keep the um, fletchings on when they're in storage, um, for example. So arrows might be expected to be stored for a very long time. Um, and whilst you could certainly just glue fletchings on and go out and shoot the, the bow, and even using medieval glues, the, the fletchings would probably be fine and stay on. If you're wanting to make arrows and store them for a very long time, then potentially that glue might degrade with time and you suddenly find you've issued your, uh, dished out your arrows to a bunch of archers in the field and all the fletchings are falling off, which obviously would be awful. Um, so, but you might have a different view on that. You might think that the glue of the period isn't strong enough by itself to keep the fletchings on. I'm not convinced by that. They had some pretty good glues in period and certainly they glued all sorts of objects together. Um, so um, views below, by all means, I'm not saying what is correct and what's wrong, um, but post below, why do you think not just medieval Europeans, but lots of medieval or lots of people from around the world bound their fletchings on, that is these flights, why they bound them on and glued them? Um, interested to hear your views. Um, the knocks, uh, so-called, um, they're kind of self-knocks in that they don't have a separate bit applied to the end like a modern archery arrow would have. There's a, there's a groove cut into the wood at the end, quite simple. However, to make them stronger, um, at 90 degrees the other way to that, um, they have a, a little horn insert. So essentially a slot is cut in the arrow that way and a flat piece of horn slid in and glued in place and then the arrows turn through 90 degrees and the knock which fits clips onto the string is um, is cut um, uh, at 90 degrees to that so essentially it makes the sides of the knock much much stronger and more able to sustain the heavy uh, poundage of the bow but what I really wanted to point out haha, um, are the arrowheads so we've got two different types of arrowheads here one type that's known by various names um, but is usually regarded as being an armor piercing head and the other one is a type 16 now, I'm not going to talk about, let's just see if we can get the uh, camera to focus on the arrowhead. I'm sure it's just going to want to focus on my face because that's what it normally does. Oh, there we go. If I get my face out of the way. Um, so there's the armor piece. Both of these arrowheads are made by Will himself. Um, and there is the Type 16. Okay, you can see the Type 16 has a similar, at the point, a similar cross section. This one's a little bit blunted, in the, uh, incidentally, ignore that. Focus on the arrows, not the swords. There we go. Um, but you'll notice the main difference is as well as having a square section, potentially armor piercing point on the Type 16, we have these little barbs. Now, I'm gonna put the that arrowhead away for a second and talk about that another time. Yeah, as I mentioned, these arrows are made in their entirety by Will. If you want to get medieval arrows, uh, then Will is a great guy to speak to. He's also the guy that made my longbow and Fat Lucy's longbow as well. Um, 
but these this type 16 arrowhead now i have spoken about these before now what's interesting is that will is experimenting with a few different ways of making these heads based on surviving examples and he is one of the few people out there who is both a well three i was going to say actually rather than both he's a bowyer he makes bows and he makes arrows he's a fletcher and he's a blacksmith he makes the arrow heads as well and there's not that many people doing that hector cole is very famous for making arrow heads um, but will is making the whole lot he's making the whole shebang and it's really really interesting um will comes at the whole thing with a very i would say to me a hema mindset but really an archaeology mindset in that he's not just coming at it as an archer or as a uh, as a blacksmith uh, or a fletcher he's coming at it um, kind of holistically looking at the whole thing and when he looks at reconstructing arrowheads he's not only interested in making them look like the originals but he's trying to make them in the same way as the originals were made and there are some clues some arrowheads have have brazing in them some are you can see that they're forged together from different elements but what i really wanted to um, just briefly touch on um, are these barbs now um, a lot has been said about the Type 16 arrowhead, but I think it's fair to say that it is a compromised design. It's a compromised design in that it's not a bodkin, it's not just a point, um, but it has cutting planes and it has barbs. Now, those barbs are not particularly easy to make. I think, I don't know if Will would agree with this, but my view is that if you were going to make an arrowhead, um, and you were learning to make arrowheads, probably the easiest type to make would be a simple pyramid head bodkin point, essentially, square section point. Making it like this, essentially a flat, flattened diamond section, a bit like a spearhead with these barbs on, is quite, you know, a bit more time consuming and a little bit more difficult and involved. And yet, they must have been doing this for a specific reason. They must have thought it was worth it. So what was that reason? Why are those barbs there? Now, before I try and answer that question, I should also mention that not all original Type 16 arrowheads that I've seen anyway, not all of them have barbs which project exactly like functional barbs. Sometimes they're made like this and the barbs actually lie along the side of the socket and they don't seem to be doing very much, but nevertheless they are there. So why are those barbs there? Well, usually barbs are used in hunting and fishing uh, in order to catch into prey, aren't they? So you shoot your arrow into, into a, an animal and uh, the barb lodges in there and makes the wound worse and wiggles around, causes pain and bleeding and suffering, and uh, hopefully enables you to track the animal more effectively and potentially kills it more effectively. Um, if you were using it against humans, then presumably, again, you're trying to make the wound worse because if it, the arrow doesn't pass entirely through, and let's face it, actually in hunting a lot of the time with a powerful bow, the arrow does go right the way through the target. But if the arrow doesn't go right the way through and it goes partially into the body, the person now has a choice of either somehow covering those barbs up, having a surgeon essentially put an instrument in or some kind of device to cover the barbs up to extract the arrow, or you pull the arrow out and a load of flesh comes with it and causes a huge amount of pain and bleeding and a nastier wound, or if it's near the back, you might even consider, as some done in some cowboy films, driving the arrow right the way through to the back so that you can snap it off at the back and then pull the shaft out. Um, so you're left with various problems, essentially. What do you do about this barbed arrow that's stuck in you? Potentially, if the arrow got snapped off and the head was stuck inside you, it would be a nightmare to get out um, if you were just left with the head inside. And I have to say, there is some evidence... Um, and I, I'm not up to date with the sources on this, so Will might be able to elaborate, but there is some evidence that arrowheads weren't always glued on. Sometimes they were put on with wax. Now, if that happened, if an arrow went into your body, you might pull the, ar the arrow out, but the arrowhead would be left in the wound. If the arrowhead was left in the wound and it was barbed, my God, that would be a nightmare to get out. Um, and as we know, um, Henry V, um, when he was before he was Henry V, when he was a, a prince, um, was fighting in Wales, and he got shot with an arrow in the face. And his surgeon had to des had to design and build a special instrument to get that arrowhead out. So extraction of um, arrowheads, perhaps 
in some ways similar to bullets and musket balls later on in itself was a problem which would cause uh, debilitation to the enemy in terms of resources, having to treat those people with an arrowhead stuck in them um, and potentially making the wound worse, potentially increasing the chances of death or long, longer term suffering. So there are all sorts of reasons why you might want to put those barbs on just to be nasty. Um, but is there another thing here? Are, are we missing a trick here? Is one of the reasons those barbs on there something to do with horses, maybe? Wounding horses, arrows getting stuck in horses, causing more pain in horses? Is it perhaps to do with those arrowheads getting stuck in equipment as well? Um, potentially those barbs, we think about those barbs normally in application to flesh, um, but clothing, gambesons, jacks, brigandines, these types of armour which were very common on the battlefield, more common than plate armour, if a barbed arrow goes into one of those, um, potentially it would have lost a lot of its energy getting through. If we imagine something like a brigandine, you might be able to pierce a brigandine to some degree with one of these arrows at close range. Um, if you get through, say, that far into the brigandine, the opponent is now not killed, but they are partially wounded. Well, they are wounded, but they've got a, a relatively depending on where it is, a relatively minor wound, but a very, very painful wound would certainly reduce their fighting capacity, might mean they have to drop out of the fighting line. But if they're now going to try and pull that arrow out, those barbs are potentially in flesh, but they're also going to get caught up in clothing and armour. So maybe these barbs are actually multi-purpose. Maybe they're not only there to cause problems in terms of wounding and extraction to flesh, Maybe those barbs are also there to cause the same problems to horses and in fact to, to make horses even more uncontrollable and even more vulnerable to archery. Um, but in addition, maybe those barbs are also there to catch in armour and clothing as well. And of course, if the arrow is stuck in clothing and armour, that whole time you can't get that arrowhead out or the, it may be the entire arrow, even if you break it off, you're going to end up with... Um, say about an inch of steel sticking into you causing you pain, suffering, bleeding um, and might completely reduce your ability to, to fight effectively in the remainder of that engagement. So there we go. Some further thoughts about the Type 16 arrowhead and why they went to so much effort to put these barbs on them. Why were they not that necessary in the 15th century, particularly in England but all over Europe as well? Why in the 15th century did they think barbs were so important to put on arrows? And finally, another thank you to Will Sherman for sending me these arrows and another plug to his business. Again, his link below to his uh, Facebook page and uh, kudos to Will because he's doing great work, great research. And if you look on his Facebook page, you will see his ongoing experiments with how to construct these arrowheads. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We've got extra videos on Patreon, t-shirts on Spreadshirt, and I hope to see you for the next video.